Well, I'd let you go on a little bit greeting, but based on how I did last week, I think we just better begin. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right. Oh, the, the big thing, the announcement is just the, the men's uh, breakfast this week. So, um, yeah, so uh, 8 o'clock here, we'll eat, and um, uh, we're not going to fly General Boykin in. We're going to watch a, a video of him doing a men's conference from uh, uh, a while ago, a year or so ago, and um, it's called uh, his, his section that he's teaching on, and they did four, four principles in the, this particular conference, is that man is a defender. If you're with us for the men's study in his book, Man to Man, it's, it, well, a lot of it's derived from chapter four. So some of the stories and things that uh, uh, he mentions, uh, some of you will be familiar with, but uh, it's fun. <laughs> it's a very cool Cool message, very needed message. So, yeah, a little worship. We'll watch, uh, uh, watch General Boykin uh, teach uh, via video. So that's uh, this, uh, this Saturday. All right. Uh, other than that, let's kind of uh, jump back in. So uh, part two of watching for his return, and as I said, we'd come back this week and do uh, the, uh, the practical uh, aspect of uh, some of the things we looked at uh, last time, and we'll mention them. I've done this before, but it's been a while. If you're not familiar with this, I just wanted to show you a couple, a couple of slides uh, and then uh, make a comment, use this as kind of our opening uh, il- illustration. AD 70, the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were destroyed, of course, when Mount Vesuvius uh, went, went off, and there are the streets to it. And, uh, uh, but all throughout the city, uh, there are replicated scenes uh, that uh, you see next, where it seems like people are simply frozen in time, that they've been caught off guard. They were obviously sleeping in that kind of position, uh, and, uh, and all of a sudden they were uh, engulfed, and they're, they're frozen uh, in time. And uh, uh, I've got many other sides, but, but I think you get the idea. Uh, the, uh, the saddest part is, though, uh, that these people did not have to die. And just to read this quote from you, scientists confirm what ancient Roman writers record weeks of rumbling and shakings preceded the actual explosion. Even an ominous plume of smoke was clearly visible from the mountain days before the eruption, if only they had been able to read and respond to Vesuvius's warnings. But obviously they did not. So that's certainly part of why we study prophecy, look at prophecy, try to understand the days that we're living in so that we'll, we'll watch and be ready and not be caught off guard, even as the people there uh, in those, uh, those cities were. There's certainly rumblings <laughs> going on in the culture, uh, in the world that we live in today. Last time we talked about the one world government in the past, uh, Tower of Babel, a complete rebellion against God. Uh, as the one in the future will be. We talked about that a little bit. I'm going to mention a few more things about it as we get a little further into our text. Uh, We talked about the powerful leaders behind this global movement. Uh, We'll, uh, again, introduce you to uh, a couple more uh, this morning, but the World Economic Forum, uh, Klaus Schwab is uh, the economic uh, guru behind uh, that and uh, uh, mentioned that on a few occasions. We talked the present, cult, uh, present symptoms in our culture, uh, and there were uh, several of those, confusion, uh, misinformation, open borders, change in law enforcement. We want to defund the local police and sheriff's department uh, uh, so that there's a bit of mayhem so that we can roll out a federal police force so that we can control things from uh, one seat uh, in, uh, in the White House. Talked about the symptom of inflation. Uh, in the, the broader term of the querying of our children, uh, the promotion of racism, which is being done through critical race theory in the uh, 1619 Project. And if you're not familiar with what those are, they simply teach racism. They teach you to judge other people. They're teaching our children to judge other people based on the color of their skin rather than the character of, of their person. It's teaching them animosity towards uh, each other uh, that's going on. And it's quite widespread. Uh, And of course then, and we'll come back to this today, the religion uh, of environmentalism. And and we'll, uh, I kind of had to uh, cut that short when I glanced at the clock last week. So we'll (laughs) we'll come back and uh, and look at uh, at that. 
the return of Jesus Christ. It's a big subject in the New Testament. 260 chapters in the New Testament. Uh, it's mentioned no less than 318 times. So one in 25 verses speak about the Lord's return. We're going to focus again on a passage of Jesus' teaching using some parables to talk about what should our attitude be like when we think about the Lord's return. And of course, we said we wanted this to be practical, not just gaining some additional information, nor, nor did we want to leave you just kind of freaked out uh, at uh, some of the things going on in the world today. And um, we don't have to search far or speculate as to what our attitude should be like, our actions, because Jesus addresses them very specifically here in Luke chapter 12. The, from verse 35 to 48, we'll read, and that will be, we're to be alert and watching for the Lord. And um, the second point is 49 to 59. If we are, then we should not be apathetic to the coming of the Lord. Uh, and uh, both of those things should be a concern, certainly for the church as a whole, and especially in the Western culture, uh, and, um, and for us uh, in particular this morning. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for a chance to be together and worship you. And again, on a beautiful day, we're, we're grateful and, Lord, um, just so appreciative of the uh, place that we live. And, Lord, we ask you to, uh, again, just give us ears to hear uh, what your Spirit would say and literally what Jesus would say uh, as we read this text this morning and do our best to Unpack it, explain it, and make it applicable to our lives. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. First, uh, again, Luke chapter 12, Luke's gospel, starting in verse 35. This is our little uh, heading. We're to be alert, uh, watching for, for the Lord. And uh, as we read through this, there'll be a couple of parables, and then we'll go back to the three reasons why uh, Jesus gives that we should be alert. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. So we're in parable number one, a wedding feast. That when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes and find watching, assuredly I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. And if you should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and find them so blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, second parable, uh, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. And then Peter said to him, Lord, do you speak this parable only to us? Or to all people. And the Lord said, Peter, stop asking dumb questions. No, that's just, I just inserted that. That's not actually there. Who then is that faithful and wise steward whom his master will make ruler over his household to give him their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you that he will make him ruler over all that he has. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the unbelievers. And that servant who knew his master's will and did not prepare himself or do according to his will shall be beaten with many stripes. But he who did not know, yet committed things deserving of stripes, shall be beaten with few. For everyone to whom much is given from him, much is required. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. So again, three, three reasons uh, using a couple of different parables uh, here in the, in the process. Uh, again, Jesus uh, could appear at any time. Uh, that's uh, reason, reason number one. Uh, verse 36, and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from, from the wedding. So that's the illustration. 
The master has gone away. He's going to be coming back, uh, and we need to be uh, prepared. Notice that we need to be prepared to serve. That's in verse 35. Let your waist uh, be, be girded. Uh, and again, that's uh, in our vernacular, we'd say roll your sleeves up and get ready to do some work uh, is, is the idea. If we believe that Jesus Christ is coming back again, and I think a lot, of, a lot of believers do and sense that. There's unbelievers that sense that in, in the world today, uh, by the way, which is in, interesting. Uh, we could take the attitude, I think some have taken the attitude, well, we know the end of the story and we know we, end, <laughs> we went, so I'm good. I'll just kind of run out the clock here, keep doing my thing. Uh, because we win in the end, I'll be with the Lord, it's all good. That, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Uh, he's saying to roll up your sleeves and get ready to work. You know that he's returning, uh, then get ready to serve. Verse 35, the second half, your lamp's burning. Again, the, the light is on the house because there's something to do. Jewish weddings uh, typically happened at night, uh, and so the servants of the bridegroom would come and announce uh, and say, be ready because now he comes. Uh, nobody send, sends a text message. <laughs> there's, there's, they didn't get uh, instant messages on Facebook. Uh, no, they just showed up, and the, and, and the lamps in the house had to be burning. So there's that, that sense, uh, because Jesus could appear at any time. Uh, there's an attitude that we're to have about us in terms of serving and being ready to serve. Secondly, we should be persistent in our anticipation of his coming. Again, verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, find watching. Again, to be alert, uh, to be ready. It's a wonderful example of that. Uh, in the temple, uh, shortly after the birth of Jesus, Joseph and Mary, you know the story, they come in for his time of dedication. Uh, and uh, in Luke chapter 2, verse 25 we have the wonderful story of a man named Simeon. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. That, that means he's living in anticipation of the coming of the Messiah. That's our subject. We're waiting, should be waiting in anticipation and watching of the coming of, of the Messiah, the consolation of Israel. And because of that, he was there, and he got to hold that baby uh, in, in his arms. He could have said, well, I could be home on the couch today, eating some potato chips. There's still some of those reruns of Gilligan's Islands I haven't really caught yet. But no, he was actually ready uh, and uh, being led by God's Spirit, uh, doing what God had called them to do. What a thrill it was for him to hold the Messiah uh, in, in his arms. We pray all the time, should be praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. But we should also believe that it's coming <laughs> and that it's uh, actually, actually going to happen. Uh, again, it doesn't make any sense for us to deny ourselves and pick up our cross and follow him if we don't believe he's coming again and coming soon. Thirdly, we will be presented with reward for our faithfulness. This is amazing, second half of verse 37. Assuredly, I say to you that he, the master in this case will be Jesus, will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and, and serve them. But you didn't see that coming, <laughs> that uh, uh, when Jesus comes, uh, there's this thing about him ministering or, or serving us. And of course, Jesus uh, physically demonstrated that several months later. Uh, when he wrapped a towel around his waist in that upper room uh, and washed the disciples' feet. Listen to what Jesus would say, say later about this idea of service, Luke twenty two twenty seven. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not the one who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. If we really believe uh, that we're to be alert for the coming of the Lord, then we should, reason number one, realize that he could appear at any time and therefore be about our Father's business. Reason number two, Jesus is made aware that his coming would be like a thief to a house. That's our second parable that he used, verse 39. 
But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken uh, into. So again, this, this idea of the suddenness of the Lord coming uh, is uh, in this idea related to a thief coming is used several times in the New Testament. Uh, in Revelation 16, 15, uh, Jesus says his coming will be as a thief in the night. Uh, in chapter 3 of Revelation, in verse 3, he says, Remember, therefore, how you, re- how you have received and heard, hold fast and repent. Therefore, if you will not watch, I will come upon you as a thief. And you will not know what hour I will come upon you. Now, Peter uses the same phrase in 2 Peter 3.18. He's talking about the Lord returning at the end before he establishes his kingdom in terms of coming against the forces of the Antichrist. And Peter says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing. That with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as a day. That's just a Jewish idiom that means that God's outside time and space. Uh, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long suffering towards us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 10 But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away in a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the rocks that are in them will be burned up. So truly there is a global warming coming, but it's at the end of the tribulation. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. The point is Jesus will come like a thief, like a thief in the night. Uh, It will be suddenly. The world will not be prepared. The networks will not be prepared. The world's leaders will not be prepared. The false religious systems of this world will not be prepared would be prepared, and most of the church will not be prepared from what I uh, read, read in Scripture, and that should be a concern for us. Why should we be alert? Reason number three, we've been warned about coming accountability. This is in the third parable in verse 42. And the Lord said, Who then is that faithful and wise steward, whom his master will make ruler over his household to give them their portion of food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Here in this parable, you have believers and unbelievers uh, both uh, addressed at the same time. Believers seem to be the good stewards of all the Lord's uh, uh, giving them, as we should. Sometimes we we talk about the fact that uh, (coughs) we all have some degree of the three T's, time, talent, and treasure uh, varying. Of course, we could add on to that the spiritual gift or gifts that the Lord may have been given to us, uh, and it's a matter of whether we've been good stewards with that uh, or not. God is not looking, again, for great success. He's looking for faithfulness from each of our lives. In Matthew 25, that parable we're very familiar with, the parable of the talents, Uh, He says these words, and of course, many of us are familiar and are hoping to hear these words from Jesus one day. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of of your Lord. Uh, You've done well with very temporal, temporary responsibilities. Uh, And therefore, I will give you permanent, everlasting authority uh, 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 as we move into heaven and into uh, all eternity uh, itself. Faithful in the the small things, uh, God will be a rewarder uh, of those things. Uh, Good and faithful, good in character, faithful in service uh, is uh, is the idea. I, I I don't know how we can, you know, comprehend or, or compare that. I thought of the idea of a, 
<clears throat> if a, a guy has a son, he's turning 18, he's got his driver's license, he buys him some junk lunk car to drive and tells him, listen, if you could drive this thing for the next two years, no tickets, no accidents, no hassles, no problems, you turn 20, I'm buying you a brand new Ford truck. But you got to keep it together for two years and show me. Well, that, well, there's a lot of guys that wouldn't be able to pull it off, <laughs> but, but uh, there would be those that would... Uh, that would drive embarrassingly slow for two years, you know, waiting for the, the, the <laughs> in these days, it's a $50,000 truck we're talking about. So it's, uh, uh, listen, what we do for the Lord here on earth, uh, whatever we might be able to do to serve him, uh, again, nothing is in comparison with what the Lord has for us in the future. Temporary responsibility permanent authority uh, in the kingdom. But there's a danger here for the unbeliever who thinks he will have no accountability uh, with the Lord. Verse 45, the second half, my master is delaying his coming, begins to beat the male and female servants to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that servant will come on a day when he's not looking for him in an hour when he is not aware and will cut him in two. I, you know, Jesus kind of jumps in this, these rabbinical things once in a while, just like, are, are, you, are you listening here yet? And uh, uh, again, this is a parable, uh, but uh, and we'll cut him in two and appoint him his portion with unbelievers. So here the servant here is not just lazy, he's uh, insolent, he's completely unfaithful. He's, he's a drunk, he's a pu- abuser of God's trust uh, in human life itself. Uh, again, uh, the believer is waiting and watching. The unbeliever is not. Uh, again, their behavior demonstrates their position uh, in Christ. Here's the main point of that parable, the end of ver- verse 48. For everyone to whom much is given, from him much will be required. We've been given the gospel, uh, God's word itself. And to whom much has been committed of him, they will ask the more. The greater, the greater the opportunity, the greater the responsibility. But both of our kids at one point took, took uh, martial arts together. <clears throat> and um, and one, one of the things, of course, that happens is you uh, learn and you go through certain tests uh, and you pass that test and you put on a, a, a belt of a different color than the one you had and you kind of advance through the belts uh, but as you do that, then you have to take on greater responsibility. It's not just greater responsibility in terms of what you know, in terms of uh, martial arts, whatever that might be. You actually take on more responsibility in the dojo itself. You know, as you advance, you become the helper, the trainer, the assistant teacher, uh, and, uh, and so forth. To whom much is given, much is required. Folks in the military fully understand that, is that as you advance in rank, you have greater responsibility. And in fact, they don't give you the rank until you're carrying the responsibility. They don't promote you to a certain rank because you might be able to do it. You're doing it already, so then they, they, they pin it on. That's what this parable is about here. What God has entrusted to us in terms of our salvation, uh, His Word, for, for us, a great privilege to grow up in a country uh, like ours that still has uh, f- freedom of religion. It's not freedom of worship. You'll hear that phrase by several people that are very liberal. They promote the idea of freedom of worship. In other words, you go inside your building, you worship there, and you don't bring it out into the public square. That's very different than what our founding fathers wrote in the Constitution. Uh, we, we've been given a lot. Uh, we have a lot of responsibility. We need to make sure we're being faithful to the, to the Lord. Uh, and uh, again, every parable has one primary lesson, and uh, I think that's it here. Believers will be welcomed into the kingdom of God. Unbelievers will be judged at that time. Believers, not all, but some believers will then be rewarded based on their faithfulness. Therefore, we're to be alert and watching for the Lord. Reason number one, he could appear at any time. Reason number two, he's made us aware that his coming will be like a thief breaking into a house, sudden and unexpected. Reason number three, we've been warned about a coming accountability. I've been uh, been a believer for uh, over 40 years, 
I know there's people that's like, on January 3rd at 2 p.m., I, got, I, I have no idea. I think it was in the springtime sometime. That was a long time ago. But, uh, <clears throat> but when I did come to the Lord, uh, yeah, we were listening to you know, Pastor Chuck and different Calvary guys, and Chuck would always have his uh, prophecy updates or prophecy conferences, and we'd read his books and so forth. Uh, and as a young believer, even at that time, I was uh, fully convinced that the Lord could return at any time. It was my prayer and my hope, actually, that he wouldn't. I was kind of hoping I might have a year or two to do something you know, for the Lord. I didn't want to pr- get, I didn't want to pray, and then the rapture happens. I stand before the Lord, and he says, well, what did you do with your life? I said, I'm sorry, I did nothing. You know, well, enter in, you know. I didn't want that. I didn't want to be that guy. I was hoping for a little bit of time. And I, I constantly believe the Lord could come at any time. You know why? Because the Lord can come at any time. <laughs> because of that, I'd be asked to do things in the church. I was hoping uh, at Calvary Honolulu, as we went there, uh, it was a small church. I was hoping I could work my way up to sweeping the floors. I, I think I, I could do that okay. And I swept a lot of floors at that time. Uh, and uh, that, was, uh, that was it as far as my aspirations of, of ministry. Um, of course, then I ended up working in the nursery for a long time. Uh, I was the mosquito chaser primarily because we were at uh, that time Dillingham Hall at Punahou. He had, uh, and uh, had a nice auditorium for the adults and not so nice <laughs> for the kids. We're in hallways and and uh, chasing the bugs off and everything as we uh, minister to the kids. And I would have been totally content uh, with that. Uh, when Pastor Bill asked me to do announcement on Sunday morning, I thought, well, one time and the Lord could come. I'm not going to stand before the Lord and say, sorry, I just didn't think I could do it. And uh, I, I literally was so happy there was a pulpit. You know that idea of your knees knocking together? That's not a figure of speech. That actually, ha- that happened. And uh, I don't know why it is. Your palms sweat, your, your throat goes dry. Why, why, why does that happen? But uh, why did I do it? Because I believe the Lord could come at any time. I didn't want to stand before him one day and say, oh, yeah, probably could have done that. Sorry, but uh, glad I made it to heaven. Yeah, come over here. We got a broom for you now. You always wanted to aspire to that, but uh, uh, here you go. Uh, we are to be alert and watching for the Lord. Secondly, we should not be apathetic to the coming of the Lord. As I mentioned earlier, our second point, verse 49 to 59. I came to send fire on the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how distressed I am till it's accomplished. Looking at the cross. Do you suppose I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, not at all, but rather division. From now on, five in one house will be divided, three against two, two against three. Father will be divided against son and son against father, mother and daughter, daughter against mother, mother mother-in-law against daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. Then he also said to the multitudes, whenever you see a cloud rising out of the west, immediately you say, The shower is coming, and so it is. And when you see the south wind blow, you say, there will be hot weather, and there is. Hypocrites, you discern the face of the sky and of the earth, but how is it you do not listen to this time? Yes, and why even of yourselves do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrate, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you to the judge, and the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I tell you, you shall not depart from there till you have paid the very last mite. Again, another illustration. So we should not be apathetic to the coming of the Lord. Again, three reasons are given. The consequences of the Lord's return uh, is first. Verse 49, I came to send fire on the earth. Uh, I think that's an obvious reference to uh, judgment there because the next verse says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with. How distressed I am till it's accomplished. The first time Jesus came, the thing he's immediately distressed about uh, is he is going to be going to the cross and experience that. 
but he will come a second time, and when he does, uh, he will come uh, in judgment uh, of, of this world, and that's what uh, uh, should be a concern uh, today. I had um, read uh, through a, a book by a Croatian theologian a while back, uh, Merzalov Volk, in his uh, book, Free of Charge. Uh, in it, he addresses this idea in his own mind of this idea of God's wrath. And he said he always struggled with that idea, how could a God of love also be a God of wrath? You may have had people uh, uh, ask you about that, or even that thought have come to your mind. He says, after I lived through the war in Croatia and I saw 200,000 people die, three three million people were displaced, uh, he says uh, the following, though I used to complain about the indecency of the idea of God's wrath, I came to think I would have to rebel against a God who wasn't wrathful in the sight of this world's evil. God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. There will be payday someday. There are many injustices that uh, transpire uh, in this world today. Christianity still continues to be the fastest growing religion in the world today. Christianity continues to be the most persecuted religion in in the world today. Both of those things are are true, uh, and I think they'll continue to be true till the Lord comes for us. Jesus says, do you think I came to bring peace on the earth? Well, there was an announcement at his birth, of course. may have been on one of your Christmas cards, Luke 2, 14. Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men. Of course, it goes on, on whom his favor rests. Those upon whom his grace uh, comes to individually because Christ came and lived that perfect sinless life and uh, died and, uh, for our sins and rose again. Uh, because of that, individually, uh, we can have peace with God. But generally, the gospel divides, and that's what he's talking about here. Sometimes certain presidents uh, uh, will be um, uh, given the title um, divider-in-chief. Ultimately, Jesus is the divider-in-chief in terms of, uh, of the gospel. The preaching of the cross is not politically correct. It causes division. It certainly did in the first century as he's talking about households of Jewish people, those that would accept him as a Messiah and then be alienated by everyone else in their families, uh, but it certainly causes problems today as, as well. It's okay if we, uh, if, we, if we talk about God in very general terms, we can still get, uh, get away with that. You can even sing about it if you're a country western guy, uh, but uh, not, not, not in too many other uh, platforms out there today. Uh, it causes division. Again, the, the number one reason, the consequences of the Lord's return, he will return for judgment. Therefore, we should not be apathetic. Secondly, the confirmation of the signs of the times. Verse 56, hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky and of the earth, How is it you do not discern uh, this time? And that's why we teach on prophecy, and uh, we uh, do our best to relate at times prophecy uh, and uh, things that are happening uh, in the world's stage uh, and in the news and so forth. Uh, And uh, and of course, there's a lot of events that uh, must take place uh, before Christ returns to the earth in terms of the tribulation. Uh, There's nothing that needs to take place before the rapture of the church are going to be with the Lord. I wanted to mention some of those signs that uh, we're in now, uh, and I'll uh, limit my discussions uh, to three. Uh, One, just to reiterate this idea of the the one world government and how it is discussed on a regular basis very, very openly. Uh, Just to put that in contrast... Uh, it was before many of you were born, but uh, George Bush Sr., when he was president, on January 16th, 1991, he talked about, we need to bring about a new world order. And it's like people freaked out all over the place. Oh my gosh, the president of the United States just talked about the one world government, the new world order. Uh, people talk about it all the time today, and nobody seems to care. Uh, that, that's that, that's the, 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 the difference. Uh, when I made reference to uh, much of the church will be caught unaware, uh, it's, it's because they will, uh, uh, apparently. 
Again, there'll be a new world order. We said, uh, uh, again, a, a government, a new leader, new uh, religion. And um, just to mention <clears throat> a couple of the other players that are involved here. And I, I don't know if you watch uh, or keep up with uh, Emmanuel Macron, the president of France. Uh, he was speaking uh, this year, uh, uh, 2022, at APEC, Asian Pacific Economic uh, Cooperation uh, it was in Bangkok. Unfortunately, uh, our president forgot what country he was in. I don't know if you remember that or not. But, uh, uh, but Macron knew what country he was in. Uh, he was there on November 14th and 19th. Uh, and he said, uh, Macron says the following, uh, are you on the U.S. or the Chinese side? Because now progressively, a lot of people would like to see that there are two orders in this world. This is a huge mistake, even for both the U.S. and China. We need a single global order. <laughs> That's what they did. They didn't clap. Nobody was freaking out. That didn't make the headlines any, anywhere. Contrasting to a former president mentioning anything like that. It's in the vernacular. It's in the discussions. It's just out there uh, all the time. Now, where I kind of ran out of time last time was talking about environmentalism and its tie to this global uh, government that's coming uh, and the fact that there's a religious aspect to it because there will be a one world religion uh, during that time of tribulation. To show you, introduce you to uh, another fellow. This is Parag Khanna, and uh, he's uh, got a PhD from the London School of Economics. He's got bachelor's and master's degree from, uh, from Georgetown traveled to 150 countries. He's a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. So he's one of the Klaus Schwab guys out there promoting the one world government uh, and the one world currency uh, and bringing an aspect that they see necessary that there's a re religious side to this whole thing. Uh, and that religion is environmentalism. Uh, it's not the study of the environment. It's not just caring about the environment. There's a religious aspect to it uh, that we mentioned last time. A couple more slides. Uh, this year, there was COP27, which is a big environmental conference uh, that, was, uh, that was held. And um, some of these things, uh, it was held in Ashram, Ashram F, uh, or El Sheikh in Egypt uh, not that long ago. And... Um, while they were there, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, religious people, and there are religious people that, turned, that attend now these environmental uh, conferences, they decided to take advantage of the fact of where they were in uh, Egypt, uh, and they gathered a group of them together, and they all marched up what is thought to be Mount Sinai. I doubt it's really the Mount Sinai, but in Egypt, it's identified as Mount Sinai. There's a monastery up there and, uh, and so forth. And so in their minds, they're going to replicate Moses going up to Mount Sinai. Now, there would have been a time when people would have been very upset uh, about that. Notice they didn't march into Mecca and develop the six new pillars of environmentalism. No, 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 no. Uh, but you can go after Christians and Jews, and that's okay. And so they march up Mount Sinai uh, with their tablets uh, and with their Ten Commandments of environmentalism, uh, and then they break the tablets because we have been so harmful to Gaia, to Mother Earth, and she's upset. Uh, and they develop and they read out then what they call the 10 principles or commandments of climate repentance. Did you know you needed to repent? I just want to read you the first three. Bring religious, religious leadership to UN public policy discussions on climate change. We need to merge a more spiritual aspect to climate change more than we've already got. It needs to be done in the United Nations. Secondly, resonate a clarion spiritual call for climate action throughout faith-based communities around the world. We need to get more religious leaders involved in our new religion of environmentalism. Thirdly, provide leadership <coughs> for faith-based communities ready to mobilize on climate change. 
I, I could spend a, a long time. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm trying to stop there, but I'm just going to mention a couple other things very quickly. <clears throat> These groups pay for uh, staff positions in papers like New York Times and others to have, a, to have an environmental globalist on staff so they can write articles that follow their, their, their narrative to bring everybody uh, on board. It's not enough to simply indoctrinate your children through school. We need to reach uh, those old folks out there that still read uh, the paper or things online. So they invest millions of dollars doing that. They're also promoting a thing right now that is happening in Paris and in London. Uh, and I watched a, a little video clip, again put out by the World Economic Forum, on a thing they call the 15-minute city. The 15-minute city is that we're going to divide Paris, in this case, into, uh, into, quad, uh, uh, into uh, squared off uh, areas in the community. We're going to make sure there's a park and there's housing and there's grocery stores and gas and all these things so that you can live and never leave your 15-minute community. You'll be able to ride your bike. You'll be able to walk everywhere and so forth. And this is how we're going to help, help the environment. And uh, it has wonderful music and it sounds wonderful and all this community uh, kumbaya stuff that they, uh, they have in the video. They're doing the same thing in London and have already started ahead on it. But the idea is in order to protect the environment, once you've been designated in the city in one of these quadrants, then you can't leave without permission. Or you're only allowed to leave X number of times in a given quarter or a given month. This is what they did to the Jews when they pushed them into the Warsaw area and said, you can't leave. That's where the term ghetto comes from, uh, and that's why they're calling these greenhouse ghettos that are being created. This isn't something that might happen someday. This is uh, currently what's going on in terms of the environmental movement. It's tied directly with the globalist. It's tied directly with this religious aspect that's taking place. And, uh, and it's, it's here. Uh, these things have arrived. And then the one world global currency. Just to talk about that, we didn't get a chance to uh, mention that at all last week. So uh, there's, uh, of course, one of the big uh, uh, problems that we have in our, our, our day and age is I identity thief, uh, theft. And uh, <clears throat> I'm sure that uh, there are a number of people that have been victims of that. We've been hit by it uh, a few times and so forth. How bad is it? you got to carry insurance. That's how bad, bad it is. But there'll be a solution to that, of course, uh, and that is to get everything on a digital currency. Now, again, you may have heard in the news everything about the cryptocurrency. That's private. In other words, uh, I, I can buy crypto, cryptocurrency through a private fund, uh, and I can send it to my buddy, my family member, my terrorist friend in another country uh, like that, and he gets it. So it has uh, its advantage. There are, <clears throat> I think, excess of 100 million people that invested in cryptocurrency. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, idea, uh, but of course it's problematic uh, because criminals love it because they can move money around the globe with, uh, without a trace. Therefore, governments uh, have come up and decided we need to create our own digital currency. Now, China has been working on this for many years, and we've mentioned it uh, 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 a few years ago. Uh, and uh, this year, on March 9th, 2022, President Biden signed an executive order asking the federal government and the Federal Reserve to create our own digital currency. There's people that follow these things that... that uh, are surprised that they didn't roll it out by, by the end of last, last year. So it's, it's, it's coming, coming soon. Again, they'll be able to, uh, and, and let's face it, we're, we're pretty cashless already. I don't even use cash a lot. Everything's on a card because you've got a chip and you can tr track your transactions and all that stuff. This, this is a federal card, though, that you use, and the government tracks every dime you spend, every place you've been, everywhere you've gone. Now, that's what the Chinese are doing and want to do now, and they'll, they'll look for you on their facial recognition cameras everywhere and so forth, and they, and they grade you on a, on a social, here we have a credit score, there they have a social score, 
So if you're with the wrong people, you're buying the wrong things and so forth, your score uh, depletes and, uh, and goes down. You won't get the next promotion. <clears throat> you might not get the job. You can't get into the school because your social score, because you're not following the Communist Party ideals and narrative, uh, you'll be punished because they track you everywhere because of the digital currency. Uh, and our president this year has asked the Federal Reserve the federal government to roll out the same thing. Uh, uh, Great Britain's doing, doing the same thing. Uh, this is a, a coming thing. Is it the mark of the beast? No. It just gets us cashless. And of course, at some point in time, the tribulation period, you got to have a beast before you can have the mark of the beast. Uh, then it'll, it'll get injected. Uh, in my office, I've, I've got one of the chips. I've even got the injector. Anybody want to get chipped? I can, I can do it after you. It's, they have all the... T- that thing is the size of a, um, of a piece of rice is how small it is. And, uh, and people will go for that, and we're being prepared for it uh, even, even now. We go on to the next slide. <clears throat> I want to just kind of mention a few things about her <clears throat> and then play a video clip. So this is Dr. Pippin uh, Malgren. She's uh, speaking at the World Government Summit March uh, 30th to 31st uh, this last year. <clears throat> She's an economic advisor to... President uh, George W. Bush, <clears throat> and a very, very smart p- person. We'll play the video clip, and maybe I'll recover here. I get too excited about these things. If you saw her and heard her, I could read the quote, but I want you to see the audience and how many people they are and the backgrounds and how diverse the crowd is, how large it is. As she, she'll, she'll talk about the, the digital currency and the necessity for us to uh, go in that, uh, that direction. No. <clears throat> okay. No, I'll just tell you then. So, um, so anyway, so she's, she's speaking at this conference. Um, she mentions her background, <clears throat> that she kind of grew up with this uh, idea in economics. Her father was uh, an economic advisor to President Nixon when we came off the, uh, the gold standard. Uh, so she's uh, very familiar and was brought up with this idea that eventually we have to remove ourselves, not from just literal gold backing our cash, but removing ourselves from cash itself. Um, This is a massive crowd that she's speaking in front of. She's on a a panel uh, discussion, uh, and uh, and she talks about the fact that uh, in order for us to have uh, a a global economy and global government, there has to be a global currency, and that currency is going to be digital. She says, I'm just going to say it. I'm going to speak boldly. Uh, It's digital. You can um, find her uh, on YouTube or Twitter later and listen to her uh, say this. She talks about the uh, inherent dangers in it, of course, and says that um, uh, we will have to also then uh, have a constitution of rights for uh, the users of this digital currency. Uh, but obviously, uh, she's speaking about moving to a cashless system in front of leaders of world governments, and they, they're all there uh, and everybody is on board and okay with it. That's, uh, that's my point. Uh, these things that we, you know, we, again, we used to talk about how they might unfold, where we're literally watching them uh, unfold now. We've said so far that there are consequences of the Lord's return. There's a confirmation of the signs of the times. And if you want to know more of those signs and times, of our times, you can um, go through our study in Matthew 24 and 25. Third, there is a coming judgment of those who are not ready. Verse 57. Yes, and why even of yourselves do you not judge what is right? When you go with your adversary to the magistrates, make every effort along the way to settle with him, lest he drag you off, uh, drag you to the judge. 
the judge deliver you to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. So make every effort along the way. Settle with him, lest you be drugged before the judge. Why? Why, why, would, why was that so important? A very rabbinical argument, lesser to the greater. If that's true now, uh, you have an issue with a neighbor, a friend, or something's happened, uh, why, why, why should you be urged to settle things now and not go before a civil magistrate? Well, you should try to do that if you can. That's the lesser. If that's true, and it's true, then you certainly should settle all of your issues with God before you stand before him one day. Uh, That's the idea. The second coming of Christ uh, is something that uh, we should be expecting. We should be living in that expectation. Again, there's events before the Lord returns to establish his his kingdom. Those events are recorded in Daniel and Revelation. We call this uh, time of Jacob's trouble or the, uh, the tribulation period. But nothing has to happen before the, the rapture of the church. I'll just um, close with a, with a story or two. <coughs> I'm watching the clock this week, though. We had a young guy join us a number of years ago. His name was Mark. And um, he had um, grown up in a church uh, and uh, just kind of um, uh, <coughs> become part of another church. And he noticed they were, uh, they were moving away from actually teaching the Bible and teaching the scriptures. And uh, found us, joined us, grew up here in Kailua, uh, was part of the church, and, and then once he was plugged in, came to everything, uh, all of our men stuff, uh, and uh, just a wonderful brother in the Lord. Uh, works out at Pearl Harbor, and uh, takes the bus out there to work every day, not to deal with the traffic and parking and so forth. Always wears a Christian t-shirt, because it, it would enable him very often during the week to be able to share the gospel and kind of engage people and tell them about his faith uh, in Jesus Christ. At some point in time, we didn't see Mark anymore. (laughs) He was just kind of faded away. And then I ran into him one day. He had met a a young lady. (laughs) They they had gotten married. She was not a believer. And um, it seemed that during their dating days, uh, she was respected him for his faith and so forth. But as soon as they got married, she was like, no, honey, we're busy on Sundays. And also, we never saw uh, Mark, uh, for a while, uh, a year or so. And then I got a call from him. He says, hey, I heard you guys are doing another men's retreat out on the North Shore. And I know I've been away for a while. Is there any way I can come? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That, that'd be great, Mark. I'll sign you up and everything. So Mark came. Uh, and during that uh, men's retreat, uh, rededicated his life to the Lord. And, uh, and we had, we had uh, a lot of good uh, conversations uh, and prayer and so forth. And then he realized that, you know, I can be a good husband and so forth, but I, I, I still got to, you know, keep plugged in my commitment to the Lord and uh, live for the Lord. So he, and he did, and he did. And he, uh, he was back and <clears throat> coming every Sunday and wearing his Christian t-shirts on the bus and, uh, and so forth. And that went on for, um, for many months. I don't think it was a full year, but it was, uh, it was many months. Uh, and then I got a call saying that I, I needed to get to Castle Hospital quickly, uh, and, uh, and they mentioned the name. And it's like, oh my gosh. Now, I'm thinking it's Mark's dad, who I had just visited with a few weeks ago because he had had bypass surgery. And when I get there, it's not the dad, it's Mark. Mark had been um, with another fellow, and they were cleaning some kind of a, a tank, um, uh, out in, uh, in Pearl Harbor, uh, and, it, and even though they're all suited up and the hazmat stuff, <clears throat> proper respirators and all that, he had become very, very sick because of the fumes uh, in this tank. He went home, and his symptoms were very similar to the flu, and so his wife at the time, uh, who was a nurse, believed that he had the flu, uh, went off to work. She worked a night shift. When she came home the next morning, Mark, Mark was gone. Uh, he, was, he was with the Lord. The other guy he worked with got very sick, went to ER, and he, they were actually able to, uh, to save him. But as I stood there, kind of in shock now that this isn't the dad, this is actually the son, Mark, uh, I'm looking at. And um, I know it's maybe a perverted pastoral thing, but I was thinking to myself, Mark, <laughs> you're with the Lord. 
I bet you're so happy that you've been walking with the Lord for the last seven months. He could have stood before the Lord, kind of backslidden and not really that committed. Hey, you're saved. You're saved by the grace of God. But he wasn't. He was watching. Uh, He was waiting. He was engaged. He was sharing his faith. He was uh, plugged in. I thought, wow, what a difference. What joy there must be for Mark. I bet he is so glad that he came to that men's retreat and rededicated and plugged himself back in. Why are we saying this? Because there's a reality to it. Jesus is coming and we'll, we'll stand before him one day and we will give an account for our lives. And I just thought of Mark and boy, the joy he must have had. I don't know if he told that story or he'll tell me that story one day, but um, he's a great example of what we should be doing. We need to gird ourselves up, have that light burning. It's an attitude as well as an action because the Lord could come at any time. That's the response. That's the practical aspect to any kind of prophecy that we study, to realize the signs of the times that we're living in, and man, are they evident. We're seeing signs of things that will happen in the tribulation. (laughs) That means we're very close to the uh, to, to the rapture. And uh, I think it's good just to do this once in a while to reflect on where we're at and kind of recalibrate, in a sense, for the, for the new year. A new year to walk with the Lord, a new year to serve the Lord, uh, and do that with uh, an anticipation uh, that the Lord could come for us any time. We plan like he's not coming for 100 years, but we live every day like he could come today. That's, that's what we need to be doing. Amen. Well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the words of Jesus here, the parables that we can understand, uh, the attitudes and the actions that are laid out for us uh, by our Lord. May we live in that expectancy of your soon return. Uh, Gauge the things we do, the decisions we make on an eternal perspective. Lord, faithful and a few, ruler over many, So many of these things that are mentioned in regards to our life now, very temporary, and what it will be like, very permanent, very eternal one day. Lord, may we all look forward to hearing you say, enter now, my good and faithful servant, faithful in a few, I'll make you ruler over many. Lord, may we be those good and faithful servants, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen.